I watched the first three episodes of Bucket List of the Dead, and it was so much better than it had any right to be. BLD is a zombie apocalypse show, which is about as generic a setting as you can get, but it stands apart from similar stories on three different points. The vibrant art style, the intertwining character arcs, and the protagonist's utter joy at the apocalyptic world he has found himself in. Let's start with that last point, as it is the foundation that informs the others. Protagonist Akira starts the story in a filthy apartment, absolutely dreading that he will have to go to work tomorrow. It flashes back three years to his first day on the job, and the contrast between his chipper, excitable demeanour then, and his depressed state now, is so stark that it slaps you in the face. I wonder to myself, throughout this flashback, what happened to this kid? Turns out his job is a toxic one. Poor and aggressive management, unpaid overtime in the triple digits, and a workplace culture that celebrates its own lack of balance. This is shown in some unsubtle ways, like Akira sleeping at his desk, workmates bragging about their overtime, and the boss of the company reducing his employees to tears, as he screams about not being bothered by minor details one minute, and then screams about not being included in decision making the next. But there are also some subtle details. The high turnover puts more pressure on Akira to work, giving him no free time to look for other jobs, and also puts implicit pressure on him that if he quits, he'll just be renewing the cycle for his workmates. Despite having dark thoughts, he tells himself that it must be worse in other workplaces, and that he just needs to tough it out. When the apocalypse begins, instead of being upset, scared, or desperate to survive, he finds a new lease on life. While the thought of having to go back to work had him in an almost zombie-like state himself, the knowledge that he never has to go back again has him ecstatic. The tone shift is so jarring that I first thought the apocalypse was a dream he was having. Helping that thought was just how vibrant the animation style became. Instead of grim monotones of green, grey and brown, the zombies and cityscapes of BLD have splashes of primary colours, as if part of this zombie virus is having your blood turned into bright paint. On top of that, the world is so much brighter than we saw it in the flashback to Akira's working life. I almost wonder if this palette swap is supposed to be non-diegetic, and there to express Akira's newfound sense of freedom. This sense of freedom does come off as tone deaf at times. Episode 2 begins with a monologue while he drinks beer that, if this isn't heaven, what is? As the camera pans down to the walking corpses that infest the streets. In case that mental image didn't clue you in, this dissonance is 100% intentional. The tone deafness becomes irresponsibility when Akira runs out of beer and decides he's going to brave the zombie infested streets for more. This might come off as odd, but the show does make it work by having Akira meet other survivors and having them react to this beer run in a way that we might. Perplexed at best and ready to tell him off for being an idiot at worst. There is what seems to be a bad habit in the early show, where our protagonist keeps flip-flopping between treating the zombie uprising like the holiday he's always wanted, and realising the true gravity of his situation. You'd think finding the zombified remains of people he knew would show him that the apocalypse is not a fun time, but the very next day he's out for beer. When he comes across the remains of a survivor's hideout that had just recently been populated, he takes pause to consider his mortality, but ultimately decides that he's wasted too much of his life to start living in fear, which is when he writes the titular bucket list. I said before that it seems to be a bad habit, because I think the show actually explains this aspect of its story pretty well. Akira was so dominated by his work that he is now willing to risk his life for the opportunity to live. He even implies that this holiday will be three years long, the same amount of time he has worked, and once that time is up, he'll start taking survival more seriously. It's no surprise that he has survival on his mind right after meeting Shizuka Mikazuki for the first time. Shizuka is someone we are eventually introduced to as the polar opposite of Akira. She's pragmatic, organised. Instead of writing a bucket list of life experiences, she writes a list of survival tactics that involve keeping up her exercise, finding water, and keeping sugar intake to a minimum. 
These two meet during the aforementioned beer run. While Akira fills his basket with beer, Shizuka's basket is full of water, batteries, and other practical resources. At one point, a sweet treat from a cake display catches her eye, but she ultimately decides to leave it behind. When Akira asks for her contact info, she says that she doesn't have any interest in teaming up with someone who has no foresight or consideration for his situation. However, just as Akira promised himself that he'd start taking survival seriously later based on Shizuka's influence, Shizuka thinks back to how happy he seemed to be grabbing beer, and laments that maybe picking up that cake wouldn't have been such a bad idea. This thought of hers got me excited, because the show is making a promise here. Akira and Shizuka are on opposite ends of a spectrum, where one end is living at the cost of surviving, and the other is surviving at the cost of living. Both Akira and Shizuka are influenced by each other to move ever so slightly towards the middle of that spectrum. You might have come to the conclusion from some of my recent Red Hot Go videos that I expect character progression to be instantaneous. This is not the case. I understand that a fleshed out character arc needs time to happen naturally. All I expect from a show's first few episodes is a hint that a character arc is coming. The fact that Akira is capable of understanding the gravity of his situation tells us that he is capable of that understanding despite his recklessness. The fact that Shizuka can question her rigid survival rules suggests that it may start happening more often. That's all I need to get hooked. But BLD Episodes 1, 2, and 3 offer more than promises for what's to come. It already has an analysis worth of biting social commentary, and not just within the flashback to Akira's working life. Don't get me wrong, there is plenty there too. While Akira's workplace is cartoonishly brutal, the foundation for the workplace issues aren't farcical. We've all had to work under an unreasonable and or incompetent manager. There are plenty of creative industry jobs that demand employees give themselves to their work entirely. Not mine, the people I work for are great, but I know it can happen. And inheriting an old co-worker's workload without any additional resources or compensation is commonplace to the point of being benign. Akira's old rugby friend further emphasises this point by talking about how demoralising his own work was, tricking gullible people into signing bad contracts and rubbing shoulders with upper society to distract himself from the harm he was doing. The fact that Akira is so excited to begin his new work-free life is a warning. The status quo that many of the world's most powerful people rely on to maintain that power is failing the people who give them that power in the first place. If working conditions like the ones Akira or Kenichiro work under are allowed to persist, not only will people like them not do anything to maintain the current power structures, they will rejoice in their collapse. And it's not just working conditions that this applies to. Wealth disparity, racial inequality, hell the housing market is so dire all over the world that many members of my generation are praying for it to collapse so that they may have a chance to get into it. So many zombie stories are about the desperate acts of those who have to live in it, but so far BLD has seemed more interested in how violent societal collapse has improved the lives of its main characters. That's a radical direction to take a zombie story in and I am 100% here for it. That's not to say that this is a perfect show. There are some contrived scenarios, some contribute to the story, like the truck crashing into the store at just the right time. Others do not, like the fact that Kenichiro just so happened to be thinking about Akira right before getting a phone call from him. There's an odd moment where Kenichiro tells Akira that you might even be the guy who saves us from the zombie infection, and I'm sorry, what? Is that where the story is going? I think I'm going to have some issues with the humour of this show, especially the ED suggested trait that Kenishiro is going to constantly be without clothes. But I will admit the fact he initially survived the breakout because he was in the bondage room of a brothel was kind of clever, and I did laugh when he said he scraped his balls because I'm seven years old. So despite some contrivance issues and a running joke that I feel will get old pretty quick, Bucket List of the Dead has a fun, vibrant art style, interconnected character arcs, and some biting social commentary that really gets the old brain juices flowing. From Ice Cold Red Hot, I give BLD a rating of boiling. I can't wait to see what the rest of the show has to offer. 
I'd like to thank my patrons, Orion Tran, Data52, Jamman5, Pixcalibur, Tyler Bennett, Tamka, Jeremy Bashik, Fireclaw, Christopher Wang, Luke Stewart, Swiss Cage, Gerald, John Lowe, Dustin Rubin, The Blue Crystal 770, and Garen. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time.